Hello and you are listening to FP Cast, the official podcast for the pursuits where we bullshit about the week in pop culture. I'm Luke. And I'm Jacinta. And this week we're talking about... Movies. Movies. Television. Collectibles. Video games, video games, comics, comics, books, books, board games, board games, and more. Gods, gods, DJs, DJs. Mm. Oh, David Jones. David Jones. Mm. Well, mm, that's problematic for a lot of our listeners. Really? No, we're not going to know the reference. No. Oh. Well, we could be talking about either the David Jones, the department store, here in Australia, or we could be talking about Davy Jones, recently deceased member of the Monkees. What? Or, was he the one that had a locker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had he had a locker. And uh, or we could be talking about uh, fictional Davy Jones of Davy Jones's locker phone. What was in his locker? I don't know. Pictures of hot girls. <laughs> Jack Sparrow's heart and textbooks. Yeah. Uh, what a horrible start. Which uh, is good because it's the good. theme. It's very fitting. Very the theme fitting. today is a kind of horrible uh, things posing <laughs> as entertainment, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Is that yeah. fair to say? That's not far off. Because uh, last night we watched the beginning of Fuller House. Mm. Now normally we save our reviews. Uh, towards the mm. end of the show, especially we just need to purge TV. This. Yeah. But yeah, I feel like I really want to talk about Fuller House yeah. first. And then we're gonna go on, we're gonna do a bit of news, we're gonna review Gods of Egypt. We're gonna review Eddie the Eagle, even though it comes out in about three months. Yeah, like it's such an early preview. It comes out in two months here. Yeah. Ridiculous. But we were told to spread the word. So we will do that. <laughs> spread that just like an eagle. And I finally caught up on X Files. And we got a lot of a lot of interesting things to talk about. Plus, I've been listening to Scarlett Johansson read an unabridged version of Alice in Wonderland. So lots of things to talk about. But let's get a fuller house out of our system first. Mm. So what is this thing? It's a Netflix original. Yeah, it gets back uh, all the original cast members apart from Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. Now, younger people might not even really know what Full House is. It's an 80s sitcom set in San Francisco, yeah. kind of uh, kick-started by three men and a baby. Mm. And the idea was that you had three men looking after three little girls mm-hmm. in a sharing house in San Francisco. What could possibly go wrong? And uh, what actually happened mm. was hilarity oh, ensued. Hilarity. Like, I mean, I was glad the laugh tracks showed me where to laugh because I was so busy already laughing that I would have missed the jokes. And it's a typical 80s sitcom. You've got to remember that until things like Seinfeld and Simpsons, there was a moral mm. in all half-hour comedies, mm-hmm. pretty much. So there were about teen issues and growing up issues and all those kinds of things. You know, they were an unlikely trio of men. You had yes. the, the cool musician guy, yeah. the, the quirky comedian guy, mm-hmm. and uh, the guy with the what stick the up dad. his bum. <laughs> yeah, the dad uh, one. Up his bottom, <laughs> up his bot bot. Yeah, it ha- had an annoying neighbour character, Kimmy Gibbler, who would uh, roll up, and uh, DJ, who's the Oldest eldest daughter. daughter. Yeah is my age. Mm-hmm. So whenever I was watching Full House, she was the exact same age as I was. Yep. So uh, they all came back. Now, we were talking about this uh, in the car on the way to the movie today, but I can absolutely understand if Netflix said, look, th- there's a kind of novelty in bringing all these people yeah. back and seeing what they look like now. Let's do an hour-long special. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, this is 13 episodes. Sure is, yeah. After, a, I think it's a 45-minute pilot, or oh, first episode. Mm. Which does introduce all the characters, as you said, except for Michelle, uh, yeah. the, the baby. Mmm, I've been troubled by this ever since the <laughs> trailers, because you, you kind of think there's a opportunity here to do a satirical, contemporary, tongue-in-cheek kind of deconstruction mm. of that formula. Mm-hmm. But it really is still the most lame 80s... Mm comedy ever. I think it's got the same head writer. It is literally the same show, but they just have, like, the internet now. That's pretty much the difference. Yeah, they have cell phones, but uh, there's nothing really contemporary about it. It's sort of got these 80s values and laugh track, and it's not especially funny. Uh, The premise now is that DJ, all grown up, Mm -hmm. is uh, got... She's got Two children? Three boys. She got three boys? Yeah, the baby's hers as well. Oh, the baby. So that's uh, Jackson. Jackson. Max. Max, And Tommy? And Tommy's the baby. Yeah. Now, Jackson's just a typical teen cowabunga dude's boy. Yes. 
Max is the youngest one who's a bit on the, the spectrum. One. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah, the middle, the middle one. one. Yeah. And then Tommy's the baby. Who's, who's just, just like a baby who does a nothing. A fat lump. Yeah. Like, <laughs> if you thought that, uh, you know, it, like, it makes you miss the charisma of the Olsen's. Yeah. Really? Because, yeah. I mean, that was they were a pretty charismatic baby. Still with the big blinking eyes. Oh, yeah. His, Tommy's just got vacant stares they and crying. Yeah. yeah. And he's fat. And he eats a lot. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then... <laughs> Middle sister Stephanie mm-hmm. moves in with DJ to raise these kids. Yes. And then Kimmy Gibbler, who's got a daughter, yes. who's sort of like Jackson's age. Yes. Uh, she shows up and she moves into the house as well. And the three guys are in it initially, mm-hmm. but then they just sort of have cameos in certain episodes. It's really about this new, fuller house mm, of three yeah, because, girls. Because the thing, it's basically a complete, you know, I guess gender reversal of the original thing. The yeah. the wife was dead originally for Bob Saget's character, and now DJ's husband is dead. He died doing what he loved. What was that? He was a firefighter. Oh, he <laughs> loved burning alive. <laughs> apparently. So yeah, it's kind of weird. It's weird because they are my age. So Kimmy Gibbler and Candace Cameron are both my age. Mm. They they're dealing with all these stresses and teenage kids and stuff. I'm so glad I didn't spend like any of my life. Wasting time squirting babies out of my <laughs> genitals because uh, I can see now the whole mess of problems that mm. creates. The, they had that chore board, and I'm looking at that chore board going, no, that's not for me, thank you. It really fills up your house. Yeah, it does. It was a very big whiteboard. But uh, I've got to say, we didn't watch this. We watched it together while apart. We, we were yes. talking to each other on Messenger while simultaneously watching this thing. Yeah, I started the first episode a bit earlier, so I was sort of updating you on things that were to come. And I was uh, having a bit of a drink while watching it. <laughs> And you mentioned this thing to begin with. <laughs> well, there was there is one thing that stands out in the pilot. That nay, two things yeah. that stand out in the pilot. All right. So the last time we see Stephanie Tanner, she is, uh, you know, like what, eleven, twelve, maybe when the series finishes. I don't finishes. know. But she very was, young. She, she was, was like a, Jan in the Brady Bunch. She was absolutely invisible to me. I didn't yeah, give a shit about her at all. She was a little tiny girl. And then there's there's a party in the pilot episode, and she goes to the party in what can only be described as a titty dress. Yeah, you said that, and I thought, okay, you know, that I know I'm ten minutes behind, that's going to come up. She's wearing this red dress, which is just barely covering her boobs. You can see, like, big cleavage. There's side boob, there's middle boob, boob, there's middle upper boobs. boobs. It's really just covering, like, two red squares covering her nipples, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> and uh, she has big boobs. Uh. She is... Uh, she's like Silicon Valley yeah, all up in there. she's enhanced. Yeah. And oh, look, I'm not a fan of um, enhanced boobs, generally speaking. But I do think they li- usually look pretty good on the top half, mm. pretty bad on the bottom mm-hmm. half. All the bad bits were covered, covered up. Yes, uh, correct. And it, they were looking pretty great. So having uh, certainly never felt anything for Jodie Sweet <laughs> before... I was and You're having a, sweet a, on Jody a, a, a Jody sweet tear, so I had a little bit of wine in me, and uh, that's all I could see. Now it's all I could see, and yeah, I'm a girl, and yeah, I'm sober. Exactly, and and look, you know, we're very progressive. Um, we, I think we're a pretty feminist podcast. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to be sexist. But when the show only has two things going for it, I feel like <laughs> you have to talk about those things. Plus, as you said, it's not like where... Like, it would be sexist for me to claim, like I did last night, that I would totally uh, go a four-way with all, you know... Mm-hmm. That, like, that's sexist, because Candace Cameron and um, Kimmy Gibbler are just mm-hmm. doing their job, really. They're not yeah. overly sexualized or anything no, like that. No, they're, they're not at all. They're no. just doing their thing. Whereas um, Jodie Sweeten, I mean, you, you, we're not... Like, you would have to look for it with the others. Yeah. But this one is everywhere boing, you look. Boing, 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 everywhere boing. you look. There's something to <laughs> latch on to. Hold on to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's almost like... Like, I feel like it's not sexist to talk about David Bowie's crotch in Labyrinth. No. Like, that's not. fine. Because, because it's right there. Yeah, and you also... You can't unsee it. it. It's the wrong venue for it. Absolutely. It, like, it's I, like, I, what's this doing in this? I, I kind of understand, because they're sort of setting up her character as like this... She's this cool DJ who's been travelling the world doing DJ things, and she's like edgy and cool and stuff. And so maybe an edgy and cool person would be wearing a titty dress... But she's, like, standing with DJ, Can- uh, Candace Cameron's character, in, like, the baby's room, wearing this titty dress. Yeah, she hangs it, on to it, it just, for a while. And it just looks re- it's out of place. Like, it's a weird, it's like a family sitcom with this porny dress in it. 
And uh, she even draws attention attention to it. Like she's holding the baby and she says something like, um, "This might uh, look like a meal, but this Dairy Queen is closed." Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's a bit where I think Uncle Jesse's sitting next to her while she's wearing the titty dress mm. too, and I'm just thinking, "You're not related. You should just <laughs> go for this." Because John Stamos looks like he's been in carbonite. He is good time. He's, he's looking good. He's looking really good. At first I was thinking, oh, it's like he's barely changed and then they did this brief flashback to him <laughs> looking like he had a baby's head with a mullet and I went, oh, no, he has changed, but definitely changed for the better. Uh -huh. And uh, the other two are just girdled up and, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, not looking petite, but not still not looking terrible. No, no, they don't look bad. And, uh, but yeah, Jody Sweeten, whoa. Like, there was even this point, because I got a couple of episodes into it. Yeah, where... I, watched the, I watched the pilot, then we watched the second episode together, and then I tapped out. That was enough for me to see what I needed to see. You continued. I was kind of mesmerised by those things. <laughs> there was a bit where she gets sprayed by a skunk, and then she's, like, naked in this uh, vat of red liquid, and she was all shoulders and cleavage, and I was just like, huh, what? <laughs> I just had this just complete unexpected experience of... of you know, I just didn't see it. Didn't see it coming. Mm. Mm. So yeah, that, that was that was really interesting. Um, actually, you know, Candace Cameron looked pretty great in another episode where she dressed up and uh, she was wearing sort of a low cut dress and uh, which was uh, high cut at the bottom. But uh -huh. uh, I mean, really, Jodie Sweeten kind of looks like a porn star in this thing, uh -huh. which was ironic because there was also news that to coincide with this Netflix release, there's a porn parody called Full Holes. <laughs> And uh, as you suggested in the car... <laughs> Perhaps she'll be taking dual roles. Yeah, she's like, they share a common cast member. And maybe <laughs> that's what happened with the titty dress. They're using the same set to save money. Netflix is smart. <laughs> and she just showed up in the wrong wardrobe uh, that day. Yeah, I had seen someone describe this series as basically a porno plot without the sex. Like, it's that bad. Her name in the parody is, I think, Stuff In Me. Oh, really? <laughs> I think oh, so. Oh, and BJ, oh. of course. Oh, okay, yeah, BJ. And Clamshell. Who's Clamshell? Michelle. Oh, no! No! <laughs> <laughs> She's a baby! Not in, not in this. Oh, yeah. oh, fuck. I don't know if it's out. I read an article. It was uh, just just words, no pictures. <laughs> but, uh, and Kimmy Gobbler. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right. <laughs> or it might be Cummy Gobbler. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Oh, I love this. Uh, anyway, uh. that that was full of house. I'm kind of mesmerised. I'm obviously going to have a lot of like podcast editing and stuff like that to do. Yeah. So watching this in the background uh. Uh, for lols isn't going to to be uh, too bad. And uh, I'm kind of curious man. as to you know where do you take where does it this go? thing? Yeah, yeah. Like, I I love the only thing that was getting through me through the second episode is I love Max. Max is fucking hilarious compared to. Every, like, everybody is awful in this show, but he just takes it to a new level that was almost a snake eating its tail. He can't act. He's He's got to be about, what, seven? Yeah. He can't act, and he looks at the camera occasionally, <laughs> and he has to do something, like, really over the top, and there's a sort of awkwardness about yeah. it. Uh, it's It's... An interesting show on a lot of different <laughs> levels, but yeah, if uh, you fantasize about anyone from uh, Full or Fuller House, yeah. please uh, let us know on our Facebook page. Even like do a, the penthouse forum thing and just write your <laughs> little scenario of, of what might happen. Would Uncle Jesse in the porn parody be Uncle Jizzy? Probably. Yeah. I think that's kind of cool. Okay. Uncle, I don't know all their, their names. What was... It's like Uncle Jesse, Uncle Joey. Joey. Mm. Mm. Blowy. Blowy, but there's already BJ. That's true. Hmm. We'll workshop it. We'll workshop it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, there you go. That was Fuller House. I, I don't think uh, there's much more to say about yeah. that. Yeah. Look, if you're having from, a particularly uh, self-loathing day, go for it. I won't be going beyond episode two. Like, I haven't even watched Agent Carter yet this week. I'm not going to dedicate time to Fuller House when there is actual television to be watched. Oh, but that's the thing. Like, I haven't watched the last two episodes of Fargo season two, but then I have to actually find two hours where I sit and pay attention. Whereas Fuller House, like, if I, like, pass out and knock my head on something, it's not going <laughs> to Get the same experience. Yeah, I'll just like pick up exactly where I left <laughs> off. So I think it's nothing fine. will have happened. 
All right, so uh, let, let's get into news trailers, etc. Not a lot happened this week. No. It's been pretty quiet. But uh, we did get the second part of the Daredevil Season 2 trailer, mm. this one being a little more Electra-focused. Mm. Electra-fying. It's got a, a little... It was a little bit more complex. Mm. With yes, a lot uh, less shooty-shooty. And uh, what did you think of this one? I criticised the last one for having some pretty, um, you know, ham-fisted dialogue taken out of context. Yeah. Uh, I think that's probably a bit of this again. Foggy was the thing that pissed me off in this. because oh, Foggy is like such a king boner killer for me in everything anyway. And I was, you know, I was enjoying this trailer. It was cool. Um, is it El- Elodie Young? Yeah, Elodie yeah. Young is Electro, who we also just saw in Gods of Egypt. Yeah, and like she was cool. She had a nice kind of presence there, and then fucking Foggy shows up and goes, "I don't want to know if, if you're gonna like maybe die every time you go out." And it's like, shut the fuck up, Foggy. I'm up on not worrying about you. Look, he's Daredevil now. Just yeah. fucking accept it. He's a fucking it. superhero. Let him get on with it. I... If you're worrying about him because he's blind, Foggy, then that's right. Really fucking it's discriminatory. Racist. Yeah. And, like, just let him do his thing. You had your chance. I indulged you last season where you were like, oh, but you're my buddy, I'm worried about you, etc. Yeah, no more. Okay? Yeah, I think he's proved that he can look after himself at this point, yeah. Foggy. You need to fucking relax. Fucking put it behind you, Foggy. <laughs> What's your fucking issue, dickhead? <laughs> we haven't seen, uh, is it Karen the Secretary? In any of the trailers thus far. We've seen the nurse. I like the nurse. Oh, I like Karen Page. Did she survive the first one? I don't even remember. I'm pretty sure she did. I okay. don't remember. Well, good luck to you, Karen, anyway. <laughs> uh, either way. Yeah. Uh, so, that was that. Look, we, everyone's going to watch it. Yeah. That's all fine. You don't need to, to sell me on it any further. I just think it's interesting that... I, I was wondering if they were going to uh, pump out a Electra costume. Hmm. Something a bit comic booky, seeing as how they finally embraced that with Daredevil, and I feel like both the Punisher and Elektra are going to go on their costume journey, journey yeah. this series. So do expect lots of sign uh, scenes with them at uh, textile traders at Spotlight, <laughs> looking at various fabrics. Uh-huh. Uh, and there'll be a scene where she finds her. Um, is it? Does he have Sai? Sai. Sai. Yeah, Sai. Like Raphael. Yeah, like Raphael. She didn't have that in the trailer, no, did she? No, So that'll probably be part of her journey, too. Yeah. To discover those at some point. Everyone will go, oh, my God. Yeah. So, uh, looking forward to that. And we got Iron Fist casting news as well, because mm. there have been a lot of rumours that the Iron Fist, which is the final Netflix Marvel series after Luke Cage, or the final one to have been initially announced, we'd heard that uh, maybe it wasn't happening and they hadn't cast anyone, but now they have. They have, yeah, and I think there were kind of rumours or chat or that maybe they were going to cast um, maybe Asian, and they have not. They've gone very far away from Asian. They've cast a very, very, very white boy, blonde white boy. Well, yeah, which is the comics, yeah. essentially. I mean, yeah. Iron Fist is white yes, in the comics. He is, yeah. He's someone that has appropriated that culture and learned how to be a, a kung fu master, and I guess you either had to do it or not do it, but mm. they've really done it with blue-eyed, blonde-haired Finn Jones. Mm. The Knight of Flowers. Solaris. Uh, hopefully it's just huge because I've got a Solaris autograph Game of Thrones trading cards that I don't want. Okay. So maybe then that'll right. just skyrocket. I have I have a whole value. bunch of uh, Finn Jones signed stuff, but he's signed it to me. So oh. unless I find somebody on eBay who's, who's got the same name, they probably not be worth that much. Um, yeah, I'm interested to see how he goes. Like, I've literally seen him in nothing apart from Game of Thrones, so... Uh, yeah, it'll be a it'll be a departure, probably because he'll be actually be having a decent amount of screen time. Yeah, was it last Comic Con that he was there? Last year, yeah. Last year, yeah. yeah. So we. Oh, was it? The year I, yeah, I think so because we talked yeah. about how. It was him and Daniel Portman. Yeah, it was yeah, last year, I and, think. And yeah. we talked about how they're there going, you know, talking about... They're there as ambassadors for mm. Game of Thrones. Talking about, oh, your big season, we're so excited, we're, we're doing this, this, we've been hanging out with this person, this person. You're like, oh, great. And then they're in it for about five like minutes. Five minutes, yeah. Especially him. But, uh, yeah, Iron Fist. Uh, let's get fisted. Fistical. 2017. Um, is it 2017? I don't know. Okay. Probably. Yeah, sure, well, that'll still do. got Luke Cage and Daredevil. I mean, how much do they want to do? They, they've got to make Fuller House as well. Netflix well, has got to spread out their resources. That's right. Imagine, uh, God, imagine if they announced Fuller House Season 2. Fuck. Well, I'd probably Fuck. watch it. I guess if they, if they did, um, what was it called, Ridiculous 6? Like, if they're going to fund that, 
That was their most successful movie ever. It's because I think it's their most successful thing ever. I think the fucking reason was is because they pushed it on you. Like, every time you went on a screen, it was like, you might like Ridiculous Six. You just watched the Amityville Horror. You might like Ridiculous Six. <laughs> and then it would just start fucking auto-playing after you'd done stuff. So that's probably how they got all the views. I think it's because the majority pe- of people out there are ridiculous dicks. Uh, they I, are. <laughs> they're so dumb. Why is everybody dumb but me? I watched about 10 minutes of it, so I hope that I didn't count towards their, their own Yeah, you did. You're part oh, of the God damn so it. So when we get Ridiculous 7, it's your fucking fault. That's Fuck. right, you're pointing the finger. You, what did you watch it for? For the, uh, what's that Twilight guy? Who? Oh, was it Fas- Fascinelli? No, Who? the, the um, you know, the wolf man. Oh. Jacob. Was he in it? Yeah. Oh, I... Playing a dummy, a dumb dumb. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I I didn't get very far in it, but at the What's point his where name? he, uh, Taylor Lautner. Oh, he's a dipshit. <laughs> um, no, I, I watched up to about the bit where he introduced his wife, and then I went, no, I think we're done here. Yeah. Beaver breath was a beaver breath, <laughs> something like that. So, Gods of Egypt Mm -hmm. is the CGI elephant in the room. (laughs) Because real elephants are very difficult to film. Uh, (laughs) Let's get some choppy ones. And look, I always defend movies when people watch trailers and things and say, oh, the CGI is so terrible, etc. Because I think a lot of the time it's not. Mm -hmm. I think that's people just being babies. But this was such a hollow movie. It is... So green screeny and fake and shiny and awful that it is really a detriment. It's not just one of those, oh, it pulled me out of the film. But for me, it's an absolute detriment to the storytelling Mm. because I don't believe that anybody is interacting with anything or in any of the locations that they're supposed to be. Uh, I found this to be such a shoddy, amateurish, uh, plonked together film. Do you want to set it up for us? All right. So there are two uh, two brothers. So it's Osiris and Set. Uh, Osiris' son is due to become the next king of the gods, and that is uh, Jamie Lannister from Game of Thrones. As Horus. As Horus. 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 And, uh, yeah, some shit goes down. There's a little bit of uh, regicide happening, and, uh, you know, Horus wants to get some revenge and thus we uh go on our hero's journey our white hero's journey (laughs) (laughs) look i understand that i I made a joke about the whitewashing on facebook Mm. and somebody pointed out yeah obviously this isn't a historically accurate Mm -hmm. film it's a big camp sort of homage to those kind of films about this sort of stuff. But it doesn't mean that there aren't people of colour who could act in these roles. Mm. And... I mean, we're not saying... that The movie's not even that devoid of people of colour. If we're going to ignore the fact that 90% of the people of colour in this movie are slaves, you've got your main main little cast of... uh, the party on the journey. There's like four of them, two of them are people of colour and one of them's a woman. So I know that it's very weak defending of the uh, the whiteness of this movie but, you know. It is super weak because they're very secondary characters. Yeah. All the bluster and heroics and the people that get to parade around in their mm. golden armour while people cheer them and <laughs> bow in front of them. Like one of the first black people you see in this film. One's an MC then the other one gets down on his knees in front of like Jamie mm. Lannister. Isn't it? And they're doing things like playing horns and drums in the background or, mm. or cheering in the crowd yeah. for the most part uh, while the magnificent white people <laughs> fan around and save the world. <laughs> or destroy it, as it or were. Or destroy it. Mm. But uh, yeah, it's pretty gross. It felt like a propaganda video, sort of white power kind of thing. <laughs> but don't you think, like, I don't know, we're so tuned into thinking about and talking about white privilege and stuff at the moment, and, you know, mm. that's that's a positive thing, that that's the discussion. But it makes me realise just more and more just how ridiculous, like, white men are. Mm. Like, it's such a... 
transparent fantasy. Like, it feels... I just felt embarrassed for everybody in it because nobody's giving a great performance. <laughs> and, and I... Underst- Jared Butler is giving 100% to that one thing that he is good at. Well, it's really hard as well to point blame because we've seen a lot of these people in other things where they're good. It's not mm. like, oh, suddenly everybody forgot to act, but mm. there's just something so fundamentally wrong about the idea behind this film and the way that it's put together. And... Uh, we blame America a lot. This is definitely an Australian problem mm. as well. This is a it was filmed in New, New South, South Wales, Wales, and it's got a yeah. ton of Australians in it. It's got yeah. Abby Lee, Jeffrey Rush is Ra. It's got Bruce Spence. It's got Rachel Blake. Um, it's got fuck. so many Australians in this thing. Wasn't Brian Brown? No, not. It was it Brian Brown? I, I think it was Brian Brown. Yeah, he's like um, the Osiris. He's Osiris. Yeah. I've got the. Uh, IMDb page up here, yeah. So Brian Brown, Rachel Blake. Turns out that um, you know Zaya, the the main female yeah, love she interest. Yeah, she's from Fury Road. She, she's from Bunbury. Oh shit, Bunbury. Yeah, and he's twenty years younger than me. Holy crap! Something good does come out of Bunbury. So more like Bunbury, am I right? Uh, oh, and fucking Chadwick Boseman is um, <laughs> Toth. Yeah, the god of wisdom. In this thing? And i have he's, of course, playing Black Panther uh-huh. in Civil War. I've never seen him in anything, to my knowledge. And uh, just like everyone in this, he was <laughs> fucking terrible. <laughs> but it certainly wasn't a role that made you think Black Panther. It was. It made me think of Carlton from Fresh Prince of <laughs> Bel-Air more than anything. Not a very... See, that's what I mean, uh. like... They were there, but they were tag-alongs. Mm. Like, the woman was only ever using her wiles, which is her gimmick mm. as a god. She's the god of love. But, and he was just sort of standing around being, like, the smart-ass. But all the heroic stuff was like... Rah! I almost feel like I want to talk about some scenes and some holes in it in a kind of spoilery way, though I think it's an impossible film to spoil because it is all just spectacle. Mm. I don't know. I want to get a little bit deeper than just saying it's crap. Like, I, I feel like... Okay, so Brandon... Brandon? Brenton. Bren- Brenton. Brenton. Thwaites is immortal. Yes. So the mortal in these stories is usually your audience viewpoint character. Mm. That's your way in. But what this thing does is it just bombards you with empty spectacle right from the beginning. So there's no journey. You never have that moment where you're going, I'm seeing this whole new world which is opening up in a expanding way mm. as this character. Like, when he goes into the temple and there's all the traps and stuff, you can imagine in an Indiana Jones movie or some other movie where suddenly you would walk into that set and go, Wow. Now we're progressing. Now this is something we haven't seen before. Mm. But there are giant statues and monuments and bullshit everywhere in Mm. every frame of this thing. So when they do do a shot where they go, look at this monument, it's like, well, is it any better than the one, the 10 I saw just in the background leading up to it? Like it never makes a meal out of anything or shows off anything in an interesting way. It's all just there. It's just so packed in. And... With that kind of reckless abandon of the Star Wars prequels, but with even less coherence. It's crazy. And the rules change so much that it feels like the script was done in a kind of, you write a bit, pass it along to the next person (laughs) who writes a bit without looking. Mm. Like, the things change all the time to suit the story. There's no logic to it at all. And they must know that. It's not like I'm sitting there in the audience watching it for the first time and going, hey, this doesn't make sense. They obviously know that as well, but, like, why not address it? Or Mm. they must have seen what was coming in. Some examples. These are, look, if you seriously are looking at going and seeing this and not being spoiled, because the fun thing is going to be to go in and and pick through all the bullshit in Mm. it. But, like, one of the traps is these 12 statues that kind of come to life with these huge swords, and they're swinging their swords in every single direction at Brendan Thwaites. Brenton, I'm going to call him Brendan all the mm, time, because yeah. Brenton is not a real name. <laughs> and he's ducking and weaving and dodging all of these things, mm. like like um, Catherine Zeta-Jones in Entrapment going through the lasers. He's just mm. so skilled. And then the next scene, he gets confronted by three guards with swords, one of them who's a fatty. And he's like, (laughs) oh, shit, I'm fucked. I'm surrendering, basically. Mm. Like, I'm like, you just showed, like, literally two minutes ago that you have these amazing skills and that you can dodge all this stuff. 
and leap around, and you're now going to be worried about three guards? Yeah, he did have other concerns in that scene, though. Yeah, but no, because he could have jumped around and dodged everything and, and beaten everybody. Yeah, but then if they stab his girlfriend and cut her head off, then... Well, I don't think his plan that he went with was particularly helpful. Well, you know, fine. And stuff like, um, you know that bull guy who's injured? Yes. Who we see, like, this movie has a lot of different locations, but no travelling. So people mm. are in a swamp, and then a second later they're in a desert. And there's this big mountaintop fight with this bull guy and all of his dudes. Mm. And then, did he carry all those bodies back to Gerard Butler? Like, suddenly Gerard Butler's looking at yeah. all the dead bodies. Yeah, he's, he's a bull, Luke. He probably, like, dragged them on, like, some sort of, like, raft thing He's so injured he can barely stand, and he travelled, like, across a continent. He's a god. For, no, it's just so silly. Everything's so silly, and it just doesn't work at all. It's so fucked. So fucked. Okay, cool. I fucking loved it. It is my new Dracula Untold. But you and love it I in will... a camp spectacle. I love it in a camp in spectacle cheek. way. Like, I'm not saying it's a good movie, but I had a fucking excellent time. I enjoyed every shitty, over-the-top, overdone green screen, over-emotional moment, ev- like, fucking everything. At no point was I thinking, mm, I'm not really engaged in this scene or whatever. I was fucking down with it. I was drifting, but you couldn't say, I, okay, I understand that uh, there are those sorts of films that are awful, but fun in an entertaining way. Mm. And if that's what you felt, I'm certainly not going to argue that with you, because... Jamie Lannister was basically wearing a fucking Iron yeah. Man suit for, like, a, the last third of that movie. That was fucking awesome. Because it's an argument that's impossible to win. Yeah. That's that's how you felt. That's how it made you feel. Fantastic. But, uh, and that's what we're here for, hmm. is to give our personal opinions. But we couldn't, with a straight face, recommend that people go and spend money. Oh, we would recommend this, this about as much as we would recommend, like, Jupiter Ascending. Like I think Jupiter Ascending is more successful. Like, it's better crafted than this. Uh, I enjoyed this more than Jupiter Ascending. But yeah, that same sort of camp weirdness. But I think Bu- uh, Jupiter Ascending is far better made. Like, this has them in a desert, and it's, like, supposed to be harsh and hot. And they're just... They haven't even had a makeup artist spray. I Fine, the gods I get away with, mm. although they were tired as well. But even mortal Brenton, <laughs> they haven't got a makeup artist to even just spray bottle him with some sweat. They're, like, talking about how harsh and windy and everything it is. Yeah. He's got fuzz all around him, and he, like, because he's just badly composited yeah, in there. Does it, like, does it, but then and does it matter that there. much? You know, does it really matter? Like, in the next scene, you'll have Ra, like, physically dragging the sun over the earth to, to No, but that was cool. But that was set. cool. Like, that's fine. That's that's those... Like, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, like, it matter. In, the, no. in terms of this movie, like, everything is so fucking crazy. No, I disagree, because I think everything has an internal logic, and the internal logic of this film is that Ra will drag the sun over a flat earth, and I think that's actually one of the more interesting sequences in. That's Mm. fine. That's the logic of this thing. Mm. But I just mean from a storytelling perspective, if you're going to show people trekking across a desert and they're having difficulty doing it, don't have them like perfectly made up and not looking at all sweating and just not even looking like that. Because you said to me when I brought this up after the film and you said, oh, well, I'm sure they're not going for, for gritty and realistic. And of course they're not. But Star Wars isn't going for gritty and realistic either. Star Wars is a camp. Yeah, but there's so um, much fantasy. more grounding in Star Wars. But Star than there Wars is in this. has people in the desert that make you go, "Oh fuck, that looks so uncomfortable. That looks really hot. That looks like a th-. you know, it's story. It puts you there. I mean, fucking Tintin isn't gritty and realistic, but I feel like they're trekking across a desert. You know mm. what I mean? Like it's committing to the rules of what you're putting up. So I've got no problem. I I think it's absolutely folly to question the fantasy elements in a fantasy movie. I think um, if the gods, you can pull out their eyes and brains and put them back in and do all that sort of stuff, and that's how your movie works, then that's fine. That logic is consistent within it. I've got no issue with any of that stuff. I I think that's kind of maniac things but but I, I feel it's more a, a flaw in the filmmaking I think it's such a disjointed thing where it it doesn't feel like ideas were fully realized it, it's in that sort of same way that the prequels fail in which you feel like decisions were made after it was shot and that the actors don't even have a chance to you know like I don't see the vision behind it it feels to me like a series of oversights and mistakes as opposed to a 
what I think you're getting at, which would be a stylistic choice where you went, okay, no, this is all fantasy. None of this is real. All these crazy things happen, so we're not going to worry about that. But I just don't get that vibe. I, uh, that was my thing that I I thought you and McGregor, who bitched a lot about working on green screens and stuff, mm. the thing that he articulated best to me in terms of selling that, because my cynicism initially when he said that was like, oh, well, fucking grow up. Like, you know, black box theatre and everything. People mm. constantly pretend there's nothing, you know. But his point was, you know, when he's out there on that balcony in Revenge of the Sith or whatever and there's that beautiful sunset, he didn't know it was going to be there. Mm. So he's not acting as though he's there in this beautiful sunset. You know, and how much better would that scene be if he was integrated into it and he knew what it was? And well, probably I, I, not that much better, to be fair. Well, <laughs> I'm going to save the movie. Well, better for him anyway. Certainly better for him as an actor and for his process uh, to be able to at least know what he's doing. Mm. Uh, because everybody, like, this is an embarrassing mark on everyone's resume, even if it becomes one of those wonderful cult fun films where you watch it and heckle it and enjoy it and, and stuff like that. It's, you know, like when you think of Jeffrey Rush and the sorts of things he's mm. done and then to be doing this, and it's one of those things where the people just look bad and perform bad and the CGI enhancements around them to show their god powers and stuff look terrible. I, I think there's some interesting ideas here. I'm going to give it credit for actually continuing to throw that spectacle at you mm. the whole way because that's kind of what I wanted out of a thing like um, The Rock's Hercules mm -hmm. which instead had that little clip of all the creatures yeah. right at the beginning and then abandoned all that. Whereas this will continually bombard you with new mm. creatures and mm -hmm. gods and, and um, settings and stuff, yeah. but almost too fast because it, it's never earned. But like, I like that idea of this big onyx snake with this, um, you know, black lady in black armor or sitting mm. on it with this a big albino snake with this incredibly white Abby Lee mm. um, with like bleached eyebrows mm. and stuff riding it. You know, there's some really interesting things mm. there. But they're never shot in a way that drives the story. It's pretty poorly directed, unfortunately. Like, um, you know, we talked about last time about we want to have to find out about this beetle that's in the background yes. while Gerard Butler's doing its, his speech. Yes. Turns out there's two big scarab beetles that pull his chariot mm -hmm. and can fly around. And he puts his little beetle hat on yeah. to ride the beetle cool chariot. Cool bit of armour and a cool idea. <laughs> yeah. So why introduce it just sort of lugging around in the background in a scene where we don't... Like, you know, he doesn't... Intro like, as a director, Alex mm -hmm. Preuss never introduces these concepts in an exciting way. The first time you see that chariot, it's just in the background while he's doing a speech and it's actually distracting you because the beetles are moving around. And then when he finally kind of gets in it there's no like powerful shot of him taking off or selling the idea of it it's just this big long shot and he sort of comes up and mm. you go well i mean they've already at that point they'd already shown other sky vehicles they made a bigger deal of um oh what's her face horace's girlfriend's uh like bird chariot chariot thing, thing. Yeah, so like they'd, they'd seen other versions of, of that I'm thing, like, so it was just like they're making not as big a deal of it because you've seen other variants of it previously. I hear you, but I just don't see the talent in there. Like you, if you've got in your storyboard, yeah, or your animatic or whatever, yeah, he's going to take off in the chariot and he's going to fly from A to B, which he does. I just think so many of the framing choices and the way they kind of shot it in terms of giving you a feeling of what you're supposed to be invested in within that picture in terms of the composition and the character all that sort of stuff i just think they were really weak choices a lot of the time i, I just think it, we're really looking at work which I, I i feel like i don't know what the budget of this film is we should have looked it up uh it feels expensive because there's a lot of stuff but then a lot of stuff done cheaply i almost feel like it's probably not a very big budget but they've stretched out as much as mm. they can but they've done things kind of on the cheap mm. i feel like we've definitely got a whole lot of b-teams which kind of might make sense with it mm. being in australia a whole lot of b-teams working on this and i just don't think it's work that's of that caliber that we see in other films of, of this nature I, ju I just think it's um you know there are far better people and far more expensive i'm sure <laughs> 
people out there. I mean, Christ, just even the shots in, um, like, the Independence Day sequel trailer, for example, they're, they're really well-considered shots. Mm. They're, and then something like Force Awakens, I, I think the shots are beautifully composed and, and, and really epic, memorable shots, whereas this thing's just a, a mess. It's like, what am I supposed to be looking at? So, yeah, it's, look, I agree that it's got some sort of camp feel and there were times mm. where I was kind of smiling or sitting mm. up thinking where is this going or what are they going to do next but it's just such an embarrassment no one's doing their good work um, and it's no one's best work in there I don't even feel sorry for Alex Proyas because I like stuff like Dark City he's directed some really interesting films so it's like what the fuck happened here mm. there's got to be a story behind it I imagine especially with how fun and honest and uh, down to earth a lot of those Australian actors probably are mm. I'm sure at some point we're going to hear the story of them <laughs> yeah. saying oh my god like no one knew what was happening and well, Je- Jeffrey Ross probably never met any of them yeah it really <laughs> feels like something that just got away from everybody and yeah. they, 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 could, they could never sort of catch it and it's over two hours too mm. we should stay so uh, it did outstay its welcome at times for me but um it does refresh the interest continually. Mm. So yeah, look, I, I had a good time. If you like, you know, Jupiter Ascending, Dracula Untold, those ones that are like they're shitty, but they're not completely unredeemable. If you if you like those other ones, and it's worth you know, it's worth checking it out. Probably not where I, oh, I kind of say maybe don't spend your money at the movies, but it is a spectacle, and if you do get a chance to see it on the big screen, you could do worse. Yeah, I, I'm going to say. And I, I don't know if I've said that this year so far, but it is a bad movie. Like, I, I think it's a really problematic film that I, I would wait and watch it at a time when you can have a drink and heckle it. <laughs> because uh, it's certainly that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, it is a spectacle. Yeah. Just a, a kind of shoddy one. <laughs> Just like Dracula Untold, I'll be buying it on Blu-ray. Just nothing felt <laughs> real in it at all. Like, not even when, you know... Not some... even those flying, like hawk gold people no but i mean that <laughs> like someone threw gold coins at the army and that didn't even <laughs> and, look real and, and, they, it's and like, they were like oh take what you want and he threw about fucking 10 coins into this massive and it's crowd like, of dudes. <laughs> yeah and it's like couldn't that have been real <laughs> like couldn't you have done that uh, it's, it just looked all made up yeah. I that, that's that. what i mean it felt like that was done on a green screen and then later and they were like oh, why don't you throw something... You know, they didn't have any of the stuff, and then they just all added it afterwards, and I don't think it it, uh, benefits from that at all. (laughs) I loved Anubis. Anubis is my favourite. Anyway. Interesting design, but again, shoddily, like, executed. He he was that really old-school, shiny... Yeah, 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 very video gamey. Anyway, the other film we watched, this is the one that doesn't come out here until April 21st. I think mm. it might come out in America earlier, though. Okay. Was Eddie the Eagle. Mm. Do you want to give the background on this one? Uh, yeah, so this is one that's been getting reviewed fairly well on Rotten Tomatoes. I think it was about 70 yeah, in the 70. 70s. Yeah, so it is the, um, uh, the based on a true story of a British skier he starts out as a downhill skier and then realizes that he's not going to get to the olympics that way and so becomes a ski jumper um who goes and competes at the 88 olympics was it yeah in canada and he competes in ski jumping because no one's done it in the brit the yeah, britain hasn't like had the a team 20s since or the something. 20s so yeah. he's, there's sort of a loophole the rules aren't that strict yes, yes and he's always wanted to be in the olympics he's a very unlikely person to be in the olympics mm-hmm. he's got i got to be on the spectrum as well, this guy. Yeah, they don't ever specify what, if anything, is different about him, but there is, you know, he's a bit... I guess spectrum is is the best yeah. way to kind of describe him. Played by Taron Egerton, mm. who you'll know from primarily Kingsman. from Kingsman, yeah. uh, who does a very good job, actually. But he really is has ugged himself up for this. He's got a little um, child molester moustache <laughs> and... <laughs> massive glasses. Massive horrible glasses. Horrible haircut. Like, you would have thought that after Kingsman, he would have been offered a lot of very... Uh, you know, handsome man roles, and for him to turn it down and uh, and do this one, where he does have to really, I like 
create this character like this is a real person um and uh when they showed the kind of footage and stuff at the end of the movie of the real guy he's done a fairly good job of translating yeah. him to screen it took me a while to warm to it because he's gurning like a chimpanzee <laughs> all the way through it and i thought at the beginning this is far too affected but having looked up the guy mm. since I, I do think it, it's a good job mm. So this guy, yeah, basically not very good at ski jumping because he's, you know, most people do it from a very early age. Yeah, and he's got, like, bad legs. He's in, like, a... What are those? Forrest Gump cast. Yeah, like those rickety brace things. At the brace beginning. thing, yeah. And so... But he's, he's got... He just wants to be in the Olympics. He doesn't even fucking care what he does to get in the Olympics. It's and about he's so spirit. committed. Yeah. It's about persevering through uh, any obstacles that he's put in front of you. And it's just a... You know, it's the classic underdog sports story. And the issue is... In the vein of Cool Runnings-esque sort of thing. Which was happening at this very same Winter Olympics. Yeah, and they do make a joke about that. So, uh, the issue being that, you know, in real life as well, when he did this, of course he wasn't at an Olympic standard. Mm. So, there's no sudden, like, this guy within a year becomes a gold medalist or anything kind of yeah. story in real life. He becomes a bit of a novelty act or a yeah a joke, and when the crowd he does his love first, him. But, it, jump, but yeah. it's a circus, yeah. And there's that question of well, is he doing a disservice to the sport? Should he be here? And the mm-hmm. fictional element to this story is that they've added this washed-up American coach mm-hmm. who trains him, and this coach is played by Hugh Jackman. Mm-hmm who is a very... I love Hugh Jackman, but he's a piss-poor American. <laughs> I don't find him convincing as an American no. at all, especially this sort of cutthroat, arrogant, don't doesn't play by the rules American yeah, character yeah. that he's supposed to be. Americans, like real Americans, have this evil animal intensity in their eyes where you just feel like if they want something, they believe in something, they're going to, like murder everyone in their way to get it Mm -hmm. and he just doesn't have that he always feels like he's putting it on he's Mm. way too relaxed so i i didn't enjoy that aspect of it but um the film's directed by dexter fletcher now if you are old enough to have seen press gang he was the star of that Mm -hmm. and produced by matthew vaughan who produced kingsman so i was actually hoping for something a little bit sort of sharper and more edgier and and maybe a little bit more self-aware but it's actually quite a sentimental straightforward feel good kind of thing yeah i think you really have to be open to this like if you're going in and going well i i don't like sports movies so i'm expecting something more than that you're going to be disappointed because it is just a straightforward you know underdog sports story about getting the best out of yourself um you know it's not about winning it's about being there blah, blah 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 all that sort of thing um so you do have to be open to it and you'll probably have a relatively good time like i don't feel that that was a waste of my two hours to go and watch it yeah i I agree to a point because i feel like there's enough stuff that's come out recently that's played with that genre that it's okay to expect a bit better Mm. because i mean the story in creed is nothing special at all Mm. creed is a underdog sports story which pretty much follows the rocky formula to a t Mm. But is it just so well executed and so sharply directed mm. and performed and everything that it rises above that? I think this is the sort of film that if it was movie midday movie mm. on a Sunday and it was on in the background while I'm uh, twelve years old building Lego, <laughs> then great, mm. I, I would watch it. And I look, I agree with you. I didn't feel like it was a waste of my two hours Mm. i just think it's just such a middle of the road film yeah like it it doesn't excel in any particular way but it's not bad in any particular way either i like the way they uh i mean it's set in the late 80s and they do commit to that 80s aesthetic significantly and the one thing little thing that i I do like because often when they have like period pieces in the 80s They'll just bombard you with 80s pop music mm. the whole time. And this, uh, they did. I mean, there was there was definitely pop music in there. But what they, like, all the, like, incidental music was all synths and, like, sweet guitar solos. And it almost felt like, uh, like, the, you know, if you're watching the Olympics on TV mm. at that time, all the music that would go to ad breaks and stuff like that. It just, I, I really enjoyed that. That really kept me in it. That's, um, that's interesting that you say that, because I was conscious of the music as well, and I think I had a, probably, you know, there's a half a glass here, and I think you found mm. the half the full, full, and I found <laughs> the half empty, because 
and, and I kind of mean this as a compliment because I didn't think about it in the way that you've just described it mm. and, I, and I think that's a, a fair observation mm. but I was waiting for that moment or that song or something that you know how like a song can just really lift a scene mm. and you can really you know like Guardians of the Galaxy does it so well yeah. and it never really happened and for me at the time I was feeling like maybe it was a purely a budgetary thing mm. because that synth music was so almost like that royalty free <laughs> kind mm. of <laughs> download royalty free 80s music uh mm. that i thought oh maybe they can't afford that big song but uh yeah no for me it did feel like sitting down you know you sit down yeah. and watch the olympics for two weeks and that yeah. music just becomes such a part of yeah. the whole experience no, that, I can accept that. That, that's what that's what it got for me my, my only real criticism of this film which i i think really is just a like is like we've said a breezy kind of yeah okay fine fine mm. it's fine film it's just the cartooniness of a couple of the supporting cast. Like, mm. the head of the Olympics committee who's there to sort of block mm. uh, Eddie the Eagle from succeeding is such a pantomime villain that there's nothing human about him at mm. all because he's just like, no, I'm an absolute cunt and I'm <laughs> going to just... No, everybody else is enjoying themselves, but I'm not enjoying myself one little bit. Mm. You know, he just never gives, there's no humanity, and it's just, I'm always going to be an obstruction. Mm. And... and the, yeah, the other... Um, I think probably the major negative that did pull me out of the story a bit is uh, Hugh Jackman's former coach. Yeah, played uh, by a, a classic actor who maybe is a little bit past it now yeah so uh christopher walken shuffles in on a few scenes kind of says some inspirational sports stuff in his christopher walken sort of cadence and then sort of shuffles off and like i feel bad but i couldn't i was suppressing laughter every time he was on screen and which is awful because obviously he's just He's just not there, kind of, anymore. But, uh, yeah, that was a interesting and unsuccessful casting choice. Christopher Bailey Walken. And he was <laughs> basically reading his dialogue like yeah. a testimonial in an infomercial. It was, <laughs> yeah. uh, what, just watch his, uh, his um, roomy eyes <laughs> slowly move back and forth yeah. during those scenes. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I would give... I think I gave it two stars on Letterboxd out of five. I, I, I toyed with two and a half. Uh, I'd probably give it two and a half, pushing three. Yeah. Yeah. I And I think that extra star would be because Taron Edgerton really did do a good job. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, for such a young actor who we haven't really seen in very much yet, for him to really play a character like this and really do it justice without it seeming too um you know too over the top uh, i think he has really done a good job and to work against type so early on yeah as well, yeah is, absolutely is comm always commendable okay so that was eddie the eagle mm. i would try and remind re remember to remind you when it comes out no probably not we won't so <laughs> put that on your calendar if you're interested yeah in that you can one. just you can just watch it when it's on itunes to rent in like a year's time it's fine and tv wise mm. i finally watched those six new x files mm -hmm. episodes yes and want to agree that even if you're not a huge x files fan definitely watch that third episode yep. which is the comedy episode with Reese darby in it mm. uh You'd sort of told me that it was a bit crazy, and it was far crazier than I could ever have hoped for. <laughs> it's a it's a wonderful episode, also because it just has so many little Easter eggs uh, that I'd loved. Like you know, I'm enjoying the episode for what is happening, but I'm also really enjoying spotting those little Easter eggs that happened the along the way. Characterization of Mulder and Scully is brilliant in that yep. episode. They work together so well. Whereas in the first episode, like the pilot episode, mm. I felt that Duchovny was kind of phoning it in a little bit. Mm. But no, that episode is really brilliant, and it is such an excellent premise mm -hmm. as well. It, it's really fantastic. And uh, all of the other ones, for me, there's some interesting ideas, and I enjoyed watching, and I would watch more. Mm -hmm. However, there's nothing about it that really elevates it to this is must-see TV for me. Mm -hmm. Like, it still felt like, oh, I'm catching the odd episode in the 90s, and this one's kind of interesting, mm -hmm. but... You know, the, I didn't love the characters, or they just it didn't push hard enough. Mm. And, and what I love about that third episode is I almost feel there's some of the modern day personas that Duchovny and Anderson mm. have developed because 
Julian Anderson has done a lot of crazier roles and more um, sort of risky roles, mm-hmm. I think, since. I don't think she's like a um, shrinking violet of a person. No. You no. know, I think she's pretty out there. And mm. I think that character from when she first began mm. kind of might hold her back a bit. Yeah. So to see her to be able to have a bit more fun, mm-hmm. I kind of like was that's what I want going forward. Yeah. And I think we've begun to see Duchovny as this kind of loose cannon, cynical, <laughs> you know, yep. post-Californication and everything. Mm. And to see a bit of that creeping in was mm. quite enjoyable to yep. me as well. So that was really great. And you had mentioned uh, the introduction of the two new agents, mm-hmm. Miller and Einstein, yes. who very much reek of this might be the future of the X-Files. Mm-hmm. Einstein is a red-headed skeptic doctor played by Lauren Ambrose, who's only actually 10 years younger than uh, Gillian Anderson. Mm. And then Robbie uh, Mel. Yes. Plays Miller, yep. who's the believer, who's more open-minded, and I yeah. think he's in his late 20s. Clean cut, yeah. Dark hair. Believer, yeah, yeah. So they're clearly X-Files the next generation, and they're yeah. in both in the last two episodes. Mm. And, you know, I, I feel like there might be a logistic thing. What we keep hearing about the future of the X-Files is, yes, they want to do more, but the availability of the mm. two leads is always in question. I yeah. get the feeling perhaps they're not as keen to commit to being in a series. Um, I'm pretty sure Dukovny is, but then he's obviously working far less than she is. Yeah. So it w- it's up to her. I think it, it comes down to her and what she wants to do going forward. Like, probably if they did, like, 10 or 12 episode runs, then she may be a little bit more open to that. But I think even he said that he wouldn't want to do, like, a 22 episode mm. series like they used to do because that's just not <laughs> not where they are So now. they could just pop in. And uh, for me, that's really good news because Miller and Einstein, what a sensation. You're such a trolling fuck. Like, they are awful and I don't know why, of all the things to wind me up about, this is the thing that you have just run with. I'm sorry, sorry. I wasn't listening. I was thinking about <laughs> how, such a how, great, idiot. how great Miller and Einstein were. <laughs> I mean, those two. God, that Miller. Now, he's a guy I can really get behind. Uh, he's fantastic. And Einstein. You know, we, we've, I've, we've talked about them so much this week because um, they've really left an impact in such a short amount of time. And uh, I was saying to you, like, I just try and pick my favourite. I was like, I'm definitely an Einstein guy. And then I was like, oh, but Miller's so great. And then yeah, I was... That's cool. I'm just on my phone. And then I was like, my messages. why do I have to choose? They're yeah. both so good. So... Yeah. Clearly, our stance here on FP Cast is out with the old, in with the new. Uh, we're Miller and Einstein, but which is which, eh? You are the worst fucking person. Um, yeah, I think that finale episode, obviously, uh, ending it the way they did was kind of shitty. People were hoping for probably a little bit more closure than they were given, I think, and. Uh, I know I don't know anybody who has watched that episode and was particularly happy with it. So particularly satisfied. Particularly satisfied. It definitely yeah. leaves the door open. And what I liked about it is it it's the perfect size for Miller and Einstein to just walk through and and, and take over. And because if anyone could sort out that whole cliffhanger, I reckon there's a team that you can rely on. I reckon those guys will get to the bottom of it and help those uh sort of old has been uh, people out a little bit, don't you reckon? I'm going to set you on fire and push you down the stairs. So uh, I was very excited about what the future holds for those guys and uh, definitely look forward to uh, the Miller and Einstein show coming up uh, shortly, I hope. Yeah? Mm. 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 If looks could kill. Mm. So... The only other thing I wanted to discuss briefly is that I downloaded the Audible audiobook. I got the free trial and chose Alice in Wonderland as performed by Scarlett Johansson. Unabridged, it's about 2 hours and 44 minutes. And uh, it was directed by her sister, Vanessa Johansson. And she reads this whole book. And it's a, it's a classic bit of literature. And I've got a couple of thoughts on this. And I'm almost tempted to do a ScarJo a Go-Go episode about it as well. Firstly, you know how we talked about the Through the Looking Glass movie? Mm-hmm. Mad Hatter and everything? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the upcoming one with Johnny Depp and everything. And I complained about what a, what a great book it is and how... I don't like that bastardization of the story. Why mm. don't they stick to the original? And you were like, oh, you know, I think it's reasonable that they're doing this. Mm. I'll always come forward 
when I, I believe I might have been wrong about something. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to concede a bit. Because okay. I, I really think the book is great, but the book, having heard it again for the first time in a long time, is very much about wordplay mm. and problem solving and sort of folding in on itself frustrations mm. and, and things. And it doesn't translate very well to the kind of movie that they're trying to make. Mm. So I can understand them going, we kind of like these characters, but we've got to do something. I don't think they did a very successful thing, but I can understand that the reasoning behind mm -hmm. it. I've also been a bit harsh on Disney's Alice in Wonderland, which I really do enjoy for mixing in a lot of Through the Looking Glass. Like it brings in Tweedledum and Tweedledee, it brings in the Walrus and the Carpenter, all things that are from the second book. But uh, the things that it takes out of Alice in Wonderland are like, do you remember the pig and the pepper? Pepper pig? No, there's, <laughs> there's this scene where we first no, actually meet the no. Cheshire cat. She goes to this house where the Duchess is, and the Duchess is holding this baby, and she's essentially abusing the shit out of this okay. baby. And there's a cook making a soup with all this pepper, and the mm. baby keeps sneezing, and every time the baby sneezes and howls, mm. the Duchess, like, beats it or something. Okay. So that's not in the film. And the well, for a fairly obvious And reason. the Duchess owns the Cheshire Cat, so Alice sees the Cheshire Cat here. And what the Disney film does do, though, is a disservice to Alice, because Alice is, at, like, quite an intense character in the book. Mm. She's got a lot more going on in her head. She's not just the wide-eyed... Mm. looky Lou. Um, she's a person that has boxed her own ears due to cheating with herself at a game of croquet. Uh -huh. She's a, a very much a social justice warrior. You're right. She saves the baby because in her words she thinks it'll be murdered. And then the baby starts grunting and she's like, now look, baby, <laughs> that is no civil way to talk. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not on. And then the baby's eyes get small and its nose starts turning up. And she's like, if you're turning into a pig, then I'm going to have nothing else to do with you. And then it turns into a pig, so she just sets it loose in the woods. Okay. And then later on, the Cheshire Cat's like, what happened to the baby? And she's like, turn into a pig. And he's like, hmm, I thought it might. <laughs> and she starts thinking about, there's a lot of other kids I know that would be really great as pigs. Yeah, because right. it was an ugly baby, but it was a pretty handsome pig. <laughs> so it's, it's really great, but how do you put that into... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also stuff like the Disney film makes you feel like the croquet game's kind of the climax. Mm. But in the book, during that, someone's like, hey, let's go and meet the Mock Turtle, and he'll tell, us our, he'll tell you about his history. Come on. So off they go oh, and, and okay. go and do that. So, you know, it's a weird structure mm -hmm. and very episodic. Okay, so Scarlett Johansson reads it. And obviously I'm a huge Scarlett Johansson fan. Didn't know what to expect. And initially, as she's sort of doing the beginning, which is quite straightforward, I've got my doubts for a couple of minutes. I'm like, oh. oh. For me, there's something about an American reading a bit of classic English literature that is like seeing a dog wearing pants. Uh -huh. You know, you know it's just something not right. Something doesn't quite belong here. <laughs> yeah. That's it. She's performing this thing. And once all the additional characters and everything come in... Mm. And she's playing all these different characters. She really goes for it in a way that I was not expecting. Does a huge range of voices. Does English voices, American voices. Goes all over the shop. And uh, I'm super impressed. I just think she absolutely crushed it. So I definitely recommend this to anyone who um, the concept is interesting to. And I thought it was so interesting. Like, a Queen of Hearts is fantastic. But you realise that people's miscon or, or like perceptions of who Scarlet is and, and what her kind of role is. Mm -hmm. That that sexy element is always going to hinder her in a way because she's not going to get cast as Queen of Hearts. It's always mm. going to be the wacky person. Mm -hmm. But her Queen of Hearts was amazing. It was this range from her that I'd never really seen before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really impressed. Okay. Um, I've got like a little 30-second bit here that I queued up. Just to, I don't know how it will uh, come across on. I'm just going to play it in the room and we'll hear. Jacinta hasn't heard this. Uh, but this is like an example of her doing a couple of different voices at the Mad Hatter's tea party. I do, Alice hastily replied. At least I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing a bit, said the Hatter. You might just as well say that I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. You might just as well say, added the March Hare, that I like what I get is the same thing as I get what I like. You might just as well say, added the Dormouse, who seemed to be talking in his sleep, that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. 
Well, there we go. There was yeah. a, a Mad Hatter, her March hair, and her, yeah. and her adorable little Dormouse yeah, there at the right. end. So, yeah, a lot of fun. Mm. And, and really great. Like, I mean, that probably sounded like shit, but put it in your ears and, and just hear all the nuances. And, uh, yeah, really cool. Yeah. And for everybody else, like, most other actors have an audible audiobook that they read too. So you can listen to them too. Tom Hiddleston does them. Pretty sure there's Alan Rickman ones. There's like yeah, all sorts that, of people. But that wouldn't surprise me with something like that. There's someone who's theatrical. All of those people are theatrically trained. And look, I know, I know that. I've listened to like World War Z, which has like about twelve really great actors mm. doing stuff. I just think it's really different for her. Like I don't think it's that sort of opportunity that she normally has. And obviously having a kid and stuff like that. Plus it's an opportunity for her sister to direct something and get mm. a, a credit on there. I just thought it was really cool. Cool book. Uh, cool reader. And, okay, um, reader. <laughs> fuck you, you like Gods of Egypt. Fuck you, you like Miller and Einstein. Oh, don't get me started on Miller and Einstein. Ho, 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 man. Call me Mr. FedEx because I am shipping. You're a shit person! I'm shipping them. I'm a ship person. <laughs> oh, yeah. Get uh, on my ship. No, have you seen never. My, have you seen my fan art of those two? Oh, fuck my God. you! They're amazing. I hate you. Ooh, ooh, it make me proud to be a boner owner. Well, that's our show. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to go and fucking kill him. So, this wasn't you know, interesting. There, there, there may not have been be an episode next week because he might be in a coma. This is an interesting episode, really, because if you look at everything we've talked about, or a lot of things we've talked mm. about, we, you know, we haven't agreed on everything. And yeah. often we, we generally yeah. come from the same place. But yeah. uh, still, we did it in a, a really civil respectful yes intelligent yeah. adult way i'm gonna wait until you finish recording to call you a stupid cunt head but you know we do it a civil on yeah. the air yeah. and then off the air we will uh commence fight club in the backyard because i feel like even when there are lots of things that we don't agree with we can at least agree that miller and einstein are uh, <laughs> the future just since you just left so <laughs> catch you next week bye